Well, let's get down to scriptures briefly. Luke chapter 2 verse 8 to 11. We're going to use the Passion Translation that night. Luke chapter 2 verse 8 to 11. The Passion Translation. That night in a field near Bethlehem, shepherds were watching over their flocks. Verse 9. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared in radiant splendor before them. Lighten up the field with blazing glory of God, with the blazing glory of God, and the shepherds were terrified. Verse 10. But the angel reassured them, saying, Don't be afraid, for I have. Okay, we're all there together. Can we all continue together? For I have. Let's do that one to go. For I have come to bring you good news, the most joyous news the world has ever heard and it is for everyone everywhere verse 11 for today in bethlehem a rescuer was born for you he is the lord yahweh the messiah can we do that verse 11 together one to go Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this moment and we thank you for this opportunity we do have just to remember that Jesus was born. And Lord, beyond being born into this world, we pray he will be born in our hearts. In the name of Jesus. And we ask that, Lord, the benefit of his birth will become our own experience. If there be someone here who has not experienced the benefits of having Jesus on the inside, if there be anyone here who has not even had Jesus come on the inside, we pray that today will be such a day. In Jesus the Christ, mighty name we pray. One of the major challenges humanity was faced with, with was the fact that before the coming of Jesus, we were all helplessly oppressed. The oppression was so bad that we had no power to deal with it by ourselves. So humanity was faced with a prolonged season of helpless oppression. Just drink, just pad it up for me. Don't play anything, just pad it up. So humanity was faced with a helpless, prolonged season of oppression. We couldn't lift ourselves. We couldn't raise ourselves. We couldn't become what we desired to become. The adversary's choice became our own will. What he wanted for us was what we wanted for ourselves he wanted us seek and made us actually want what he wants helplessly so we surrendered to his influence we surrendered to his power we surrendered to his oppressive might in fact david put it this way he said the lord has delivered me from the adversary that was stronger than i the point we're dealing with is the fact that until jesus came no man on earth had the record of having dominion over the devil. Because there was no such power made available to humanity after the fall of Adam. So none of us, not Abraham, not Moses, not Joshua, none of us, as wonderful as the prophets were, including Elijah, at certain moments we got to see how Elijah himself succumbed to the influence of the adversary when Elijah came under the depressive influence of the adversary and he said it is better for me that I die so humanity was helplessly oppressed the Bible talks about the daughter of uh, Abraham Jesus entered into a church a synagogue and he saw this woman who was bent low and the Bible says she was the daughter of Abraham but the enemy has bent her so low that the Bible says she tries to lift up herself but she was unable to because the force keeping her down was stronger than the might available on the inside of her. So until Jesus came inside the church and Jesus came into her life, that woman could not be free from the oppressive power of the adversary. I'm trying to make you understand how that without him, there are things you are struggling with that you can't overcome. 
there are things you're struggling with that you can overcome because the Bible says here was this daughter of Abraham the Bible says she's done everything to lift up herself but she wasn't able to including coming to church she came to church and church could not solve the problem because church does not solve your problem it is Christ in the church that solves your problem it is not coming to church that saves you. It is coming to Christ that saves you. It is not coming to church that redeems you. It is coming to Christ that redeems you. No matter how beautiful your church is, and I thank God your church is fantastic. You have good chairs, you have good lights, you have good mirrors and all kinds of stuff. Cameras and the rest of that. Good sound system. Hey, let me say something here. None of that can save you. The sound system can't save you. The light of your church can save you. It's only the light of the world that can save you, not the light of your church. It is not the location of your church that will save you. Your church can be in a fantastic place like this in Guarimpa. Your church can be in the heart of Asokoro. In fact, your church can be in the villa because there is a church in the villa and yet the most corrupt place on earth today is the villa. So it tells you that where your church is located doesn't save you. Whether your church is made with marbles and golds and glass, whatever your church is made with, it's important to know that it is Christ in us that is the hope of glory. It is Christ being born in us that makes the difference. We had a case of a man, lest you think I'm only talking about women who are under the oppression of the adversary. We had a case of a man that the Bible says that he was a demoniac. He was a man that was oppressed by the adversary, helplessly so. And the Bible says he was in a place called Gadara. And whilst he was there, the Bible said this man, those who were close to him, have tried to help him. But the Bible said they couldn't help him. They tied him. He breaks the chains. Nobody could help this man. In an attempt to help himself, the Bible says this man was so battered on the inside that in order to better his own life, to make himself better, he will pick on what the enemy makes him think is okay and he will pick on that and will use that to think he is helping himself only to find out he's hurting himself the more. The Bible says he will, he will break chains, he will hurt himself, thinking he's helping himself. Does that not ring a bell to all of us? Does that not ring a bell in our minds? And does that not remind us of our young people who will think they are trying to be bold on tramadol? Who will think they are trying to be bold on heroin and cocaine? Who will think they are helping themselves by going on alcohol and cocktails of them? It's all in an attempt to help myself. I, I, I don't want to remember the pain. I don't want to feel the pain. So I have to numb the pain. And, and the best way to do it is somebody tells me, if you take this, you will stop feeling that. And so I take that to stop feeling this and I'm destroying myself. The Bible says that man could not help himself. It teaches us something as a church to become more compassionate towards people whose lives have been destroyed on a daily basis in an attempt to help themselves. They do destructive things in the name of trying to help themselves. Some of you know very well that I'm always at the rehab. I'm always at the rehabilitation center here in Abuja, right just close to us here in Guarimpa. And, and I get to this place, I'm not talking about a rehabilitation center for the poor. People pay millions to stay there for just about a week or two. So I get there, I see children of emirs and I see children of governors and, and children of people in positions of power. Some of them were flown into the country quietly because nobody must know 
that the son of Susan so pressed and is on drugs and so they fly them into the country quietly and they move them straight to the rehab and they keep them there. It's a high profile environment. Place the lawns and everything looks so beautiful except the people inside whose lives are ugly. I talk, Pastor Sunday, I talk with this kid, brilliant kid. Some of them studying engineering until somebody introduced something to them and said to them, you will be bold. Why are you so cowardice? Why, I mean, why are you so timid? Why are you so, in a bid to overcome timidity, they are introduced to something that they believe will jack them up and cause them to be bold and, and confront anybody. It, you see, it's, it is a boldness they weren't looking for, but what they are using to secure boldness is a damaging instrument. We need to become more compassionate towards this generation. When we all couldn't climb the ladder to God, he brought the, oh good me. When we all couldn't set up a ladder because we lack the moral competence, we lack the moral capacity to build ladders to him. Therefore, in his own righteousness, he dropped a ladder to us. And not only did he drop it and say, come up, he came down to pick us up so that we can all go up together with him. Would you put your hands together for him? Every time as, as someone who is the son of a military man, I love military movies because I'm a military boy. I, I grew up in a military barracks and, and I love things that are serious minded. Um, I, I, I'm not the kind... That likes all these movies where people are just walking around aimlessly in the name of looking for love or trying to show love. I, it, it confuses me. Just walking around and just sit down over coffee. The moods of, I mean, it, it bores me. I can sleep. But, but let me see an Arnold Schwarzenegger on a mission. Uh, let me see a Sylvester Salon on a mission. Let me see some Navy SEALs on mission. Let me see some commandos on mission. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I like that kind of a thing, you know. But, but one of the things that I love the most about the SEALs is when you, they are going on an extraction mission. When they have to go pick out someone who belongs to the SEAL captured somewhere or a prisoner of war. And, and in such cases, sometimes they may need to have a stealth helicopter helicopter come into the enemy's territory and when he comes in there the enemy is unable to notice just like what happened with the killing of uh, Osama bin Laden they moved into Afghanistan under radar with a stealth helicopter that made it impossible for the Pakistani uh, you know military base next to Osama bin Laden's place to pick up their coming in that's how you will arrive to some you will arrive in this 24 I'm telling you See, before they know you've arrived already, you are going to be on a stealth mode in 2024. Just, just when they are like, where is he? No, he just left. How did he get here? No, he got it yesterday. They, they will always be catching up late. They will be catching up late. Can I have an amen in the house of God? Let me touch on it, but say I'm coming on a stealth mode just like, yeah. You'll not see me coming. You'll just hear I've gone. I'm gone. <laughs> Praise God. Just when you're like, ah, Reverend Sam is here. No, sorry, he's there. The Bible says that's the way of the wind. That's the way of one that is born of the spirit. His ways like that of the wind. Just when you're thinking the wind is here, it's gone. They came in quietly and here's what I want to say. One of the things about extraction is that when they come, the helicopter stays and then when he stays, it drops a ladder. All right? Now the person in captivity can climb out. So someone must climb down. And the person comes to the one in captivity. On the strength of the one that is free. On the strength of the one that is free. The bound will be lifted. So he comes down, turns you loose. Sometimes... In order to extract the living, in order to extract the bound, the living dies. I've seen people come on extraction mission, 
just to extract one person and you end up losing as much as four or five of them. Just for one person to leave, some to die. But of great importance is the fact that after you have been rescued from the prison, you must now be lifted into the helicopter and be taken out of the place from where you've been extracted. Doesn't that tell us the story of redemption? How that Jesus did not just save us in our sins. He saved us from our sins. And translated us into the kingdom of his marvelous light. He didn't save us and leave us. He saved us and lifted us. He translated us. He changed us. So one of the reasons why Jesus was born was because of the helpless op oppression that was prevailing on the face of the earth before he came. Humanity was not just helplessly oppressed, but hopelessly afflicted. We will wake up with marks on our bodies. Just look straight as if I'm not talking to you. They will press us in the night. And when they press us, Jesus! And they will wake up. And they come again. Not only do they press us, they sit on us. It's not bad. For someone like me, in 1985, Pastor 85 to 88, I didn't know that when I moved from Kaduna to Bochi, I didn't know that I moved from, so to say, a place of freedom to a place of oppression. I would just notice in the night that I'm feeling like I'm bleeding. And boom, I wake up, blood all over the place. So it's almost like every night, my mother is here. My mother will carry ice and, you know, and she'll pray. But 1989, that ladder, that, that, that helicopter came over our house. Stayed over, dropped a ladder and sent me the help that is found in Christ. From 1989 till date, the adversary has not been born. I don't pray about it. The adversary has not been born to dare it. Because the first thing I was exposed to, 1989, is the fact that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. This is why Christ was born. There is someone watching me right now, like, like that man who was cutting himself and couldn't help himself. You've been hurting yourself in order to help yourself. I was talking to a lady and she was saying to me, I was saying to her, because she's been, she said, Pastor Sam, I'm tired of sleeping around with men. They'll promise they'll give me a job. They'll promise they'll give me this. She said, so I, I just sleep around. So, so I said, can we even talk now? I said, so like, how much have you made? I said, how long have I been doing this thing? For three years now, sleeping around with this man. She said, she, I said, how much have you made? She said, Pastor, that's, um, that if I have made money, will I be talking to you? I said, but you say they give you 10,000, 100,000, 1 million, and all of that. She said, Pastor, you know the way this thing is now. I said, I don't know because I've not practiced it before. So, she said, you know the way this thing is now. I said, how, how is it? And she said to me, she said, sir, you know the money that comes through things like this doesn't last. I said, oh, you know? She says that there's something among all of us who do this thing. There is this belief that one day, one day, your life will change. That that's how we keep going, sir. We keep going. We keep going. But look at what is happening to me right now, sir. Already she was infected. She was already infected. That was why she came. So prayer is the issue now. Can God show mercy? So that HIV negative can, positive can turn to negative. Helplessly so. Do you judge her? I can't judge her. It's not my calling to judge her. My calling is to help her. She was out to help herself only to find out she was hurting herself. There are many wombs that are gone because people wanted to help themselves. 
behind every behind every issue of abortion why do we have abortion as an issue today in the united states and in the western world behind every need to commit abortion is a desire to help a young girl who believes that the pregnancy is going to disrupt her life So in order to help me, let me get rid of the pregnancy. Only for me to do that and then I get into a bigger problem with conscience. Nights of having dreams and seeing babies crying. Or sometimes later in life when it's now time to have your own children for whatever reason you begin to have difficulty in having uh, children sometimes not even related to what you did before just some hormonal issues but guilt comes in and say maybe God is punishing me for what I did before it was a problem I was trying to solve but then I ended up creating another one why do we drink why do we drink alcohol why are we on Heineken and Gulda and all of that? When you are taking it, when you are buying it, what was in your mind? It will help me to chill, relax. Huh? What else? Say it again. Uh huh. Whatever. Just. So, there, there's, so there's an intention in mind to secure something beyond the bottle. And that's how we take it. So I'm taking the bottles, I'm drinking the alcohol, and, and uh, you know, as a pastor I take 7%, then Deacon takes about 14. Then workers take 21. Church members take 45% alcohol. Then those who just come to church, they take full status, full option. <laughs> and, and, and when we take this, the liver then becomes the issue. So there's a problem we're trying to solve, but there's another problem we are creating. And the problem we're creating is going to be a compounded one. And when the impact of that starts, we took it gradually. But when it comes, it wipes us out immediately. See, everything that matters. Why do we steal? Why do we steal as workers, staff, as government officials? Why do we steal? As members of church, why do we steal from even God? Why do we steal? <laughs> so when, when it's time for us to steal, have you watched movies where if there's a CCTV camera and people want to steal, they'll carry something and block it, right? So when we want to steal from God, it's like they just do like this. They are blocking God from seeing them. God will not see me. Why do we do that? We steal in order to help. I want to make sure that the future is better. I want to make sure my children are okay. I want to make sure. So we steal. There is this insatiable desire in man to fix life. And in order to fix life, we pursue whatever is considered a good option. Only to find out later, it is detrimental to our own lives, our eternal life, our physical life, our mental life, and our emotional life. That's why the Bible said there is a way that seems right to a man. It is not the way, it is the end. So man was helplessly oppressed hopelessly afflicted carry disease we we just we don't know what to do that woman was bent low until jesus came inside and when jesus entered jesus said come to me and do myself for the first time I've, I've, I've come to church but i've not come to christ that was the day we got to see the difference between being in church 
and being in Christ. Coming to church and coming to Christ. Sir, she has been a member of that church for only God knows how long. But the first day she met with Jesus, her life forever changed. Don't meet church, meet Christ. Don't be in church, be in Christ. Don't have church, have what? Christ. Because it is Christ in us that is what, sir? The hope of glory. Dressing in red doesn't mean you are washed in the blood. The colors we wear does not reflect the blood that we have. Your red can be more reddish than the blood, but if you don't have the blood, you are not cleansed. My daughter looked at me this morning. She said, Dad, she likes me to compliment her. She's the one that look at me and says, sorry dad, you didn't notice that I just did my hair? <laughs> I said, God will give you a good husband. I said, oh no, your hair is beautiful. So good. How about the back? I said, no, cool. So now I've learned without being told, as soon as she showed, oh, sweetheart, your hair is amazing. So this morning she showed up and she just came to parade in my front. I know what it was all about. It was a compliment. And I said, wow, sweetie, you look good. And she would like to give me a high five. So I give her a high five. And I was still going through my materials. And then while she passed by, she came back later. She said, well, dad, you know, I never knew that red looks good on me. I'm like, uh, because my, my, my children are very delicate don't think you know where they are going to when they are talking. So slow down. Or as you jump in, I realize they'll just drop you somewhere else. You know, so I'm like, okay, yeah, I, I said, I think so too. Uh, she said, you know, I didn't know that red is really beautiful on me. This is for the first time I'm beginning to appreciate myself on red. I said, this is so amazing. And in fact, really, I'm also beginning to see it that you look very stunning in red. Oh, she said, thank you. And then she walked out of the place. And in my mind, I said, I look so good on red. And I said to myself, how beautiful and how wonderful is the blood of Jesus. You look so beautiful under the blood. I tell you, you look, you look so beautiful covered by the blood. You look so beautiful washed by the blood. Help me look at your neighbor and say, you look so beautiful washed by the blood. You look so beautiful. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Nothing. Oh, precious now. Is that that makes me see no art? Nothing but the blood of. We were helplessly, were helplessly oppressed, hopelessly afflicted. But beyond that, I'm sure there's a sound we're hearing somewhere. They're going to take that off. But beyond that, we're miserably doomed. There was no future for any of us. No education, no family background could secure a future so beautiful for us in the world beyond this place. It, listen, the, the, the most, the most, the most, the most educated without Christ still heads to hell. Now, now, will a good God send people to hell? Don't rationalize God. That is yes. 
Rejecting God is the worst thing that can happen to God. Have you noticed something about men? Because we're created in the image of God. I don't know if there's any man here who will agree with me. One of the major things most men can handle is what? Say it loud and clear. Rejection. You know why? It is the only reason why men will go to hell. People are not going to hell because of their sins. Jesus already died for that. You see, that creates conflict in the body of Christ. The truth is that Jesus already died for sins committed in the past, in the present, and in the future. He's paid the price. The only reason men will go to hell is that they have now refused to accept the one who died for them. Does that make sense to us now? <laughs> so, so, so it's important for you to know that the reason why men will go to hell is not because of the sins they are committing. No, that has been paid for. If there is a need to pay extra for that sin, then the death of Jesus is incomplete. <laughs> Follow me carefully. Don't let religion get into your mind now. Can I say it boldly again so that somebody will get it right? There is no sin you are committing now that is going to take you to hell. Oh, Pastor Sam. Oh. <laughs> no, no, no. You know why? Jesus already, no matter how you feel, religious people, no ma see, your feeling can't change what happened. And by the way, the death of Jesus is once. The gravity of your sin will not make God to say, sorry, uh, son, you have to go back. What that person just did, I'm so angry. If, if you don't go back and die again. <laughs> the Bible says it is once. And that death, once on the cross, is perfect. Perfect. Oh, come on. I said the word perfect. He's paid the price. He's paid the price. Help me look at your neighbor say he, and say to the person, he paid the price. <laughs> Pastor Sam, how about abortion? Huh? Pastor, Pastor Sam, the person just committed the abortion. So what do we do? Jesus should come back again and die for this one that just committed abortion. No, before you were born, he died for what you will commit. Before you were born, before you were born, before you started thinking sin, he had anticipated what you will do. Because he's the one that knows the end from the beginning thereof. He died for your sins. He paid the price for your sin. Present, future, and past. Pastor Sam, if that is the case, why would men go to hell? Rejecting him. Him. Not accepting him into your life. Two, not accepting his lordship over your life. So it's about in and over. <laughs> so, for those who always say, oh, Pastor Sam, is that not giving people license to sin? No. Because if you get the message we're talking, there are two sides to this message. One, the sin paid for, and the person who paid the sin. Is that okay? The sin has been taken care of. But the person who died for you must be attended to. That's what the Bible says. As many as believe in him, as many as receive him, 
he gave those ones the power to become the sons of God. So it's about receiving him two ways, into your life and over your life. Uh-huh. Here's where the robber meets the road now. He, if he is in your life, Christ in us, if he is in your life and he is the Lord over your life, you cannot continue in what you used to do before he came into your life. <laughs> Does that make sense now? If he dwells in me, if he lives in me, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. If he dwells on the inside of me and is Lord over my life, I don't do what I want to do as I used to do it before I met him. I don't eat what I used to eat because in me changes my appetite. And if you don't understand what that means, ask pregnant women. The moment a child enters them, it alters them. Am I helping somebody here? The moment a child enters a woman, it alters the woman. So my wife will call me. Hello, baby. I say, yeah. How are you? I'm not fine. Where are you? I say, I'm on my way home. Con, 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 con. I say, baby, I say, I'm on my way home. She said, yeah, stop by the road. And then she'll be specific. She said, that one, under that tree. Rev Samoe. <laughs> I remember one day I was living from here. She said, baby, baby. I said, yes. She said, Mr. Biggs, Mr. Biggs. I said, what happens, Mr. Biggs? She said, enter there, enter there. She said, ask them for pap. I said, me. Somebody said something has entered her. Say it has altered her. Oh, when Jesus enters you, he alters you. Can, can I, 21st century, can I talk to you about this? When Jesus truly enters your life, forget about what you have done. Your sin is not an issue. The question is the one who died for your sin. Has he entered you? You are not going to hell for the sins you committed. You are going to hell because of the one who died and you rejected. Rejection is the only thing God can stand from his creatures. So when it comes on the inside of us, suddenly we begin to notice, you want to start, I have cravings. Then your wife will just call you and say, sorry, Akara. It's so bad with some women that when you just land where you buy it, I said, like, how much should I buy? She said, no, 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 no. Rice. <laughs> ah, Father, thank you. I'm done with that era. <laughs> I'm not telling somebody's story. What my eyes saw, Mama Miriui. Mm. Hmm. I'll never forget the day I, my wife woke up. I said, baby, what do you want to take? She said, I feel like taking cocoa. Sorry, some of you don't know that, sir. Cocoa is local pap from the northern side. She said, I feel like taking... I said, baby, you must find where Hausa people gather in clusters. She said, baby, let me find it. What my eyes have seen in marriage. When I'm coming to this world again, I'm coming as a woman. I'm, uh, and by the way, I'm not marrying any broke brother. No, me Miko. <laughs> Next life. What? In fact, I will choose where I'll be born. Good neighborhood. <laughs> From Kikere, nice, pampered, very pampered from childhood. Then choose where, see, mommy. With all I've seen in this life, I come next life. I, you must be born again. You're a loving child of God. You're a Boaz. 
In fact, we inspect your bank account. <laughs> she said, help me get the cocoa. I said, really, baby? She said, I said, where do I? She said, just walk. That's how I got into it. We said, because we went to the hotel. Ma, early in the morning, consider every time. Started walking inside. Con I said, please. Uh, Oga, where did they say cocoa for you? Say, Oga, come follow this place, ma. Then you go turn to Come and see me trekking inside, we say. I finally got to a place where I found cocoa. I bought it, held it in nylon. If you see the boldness with which I'll enter the hotel, it was very clear. Ask me no question. <laughs> because somebody's taste has been altered. Ah. When Jesus enters you, he alters you. The things I used to do, I do them no. The place I used to go, all the things I used to drink, there's a great change since How do we know Jesus has entered you? If any man be in Christ, is a new creature. All things are what's up. Past, behold, all things have become taste, has become where you go, has become where you fellowship, has become the kind of friends you keep, have become. He, born, he was born to deliver us from the helplessness, the hopelessness, and the misery that we're all locked in. You've tried to be right by yourself, but you have no might to be right. So Jesus came on the inside with light, so that with the light of God on the inside of you, you can begin to live the kind of life that you've always wanted to live in accordance with God's word, but without the might required to do so. For it is him at work in us, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. He is working in us. On this Christmas day, let me remind you seven things quickly and I want to get out of your face. Number one, seven things, seven benefits of Christmas. Number one, Jesus was born to bring you freedom. Jesus was born to bring you freedom. Galatians chapter 3 verse 13, the amplified version. Christ purchased our freedom and redeemed us. So he was born to give you freedom. That was why Jesus was born today. He was born today. Please, the date is not December 25, but he was born. December 25 was just chosen. It does, so don't let anybody fool you and say Jesus was born December 25. He could have been born November 12th. He could have been born January 22. The most important thing is that Jesus is born, was born. There was a time we have records that he was born. Sometimes in the wisdom of God, in order not to allow certain people who walk with God to be idolized, God keeps certain things about them in a mystery. For instance, the death of Moses, God did not allow Israel to know where it was because they would idolize it. The departure of Elijah was also not noticeable because they would idolize it. So God in his wisdom sometimes keeps certain things like the date of Jesus lest all other persons born in April 13 feel so inferior that the Savior was born on Pastor Sunday's birthday. So glory be to God we don't know the date. I can as well tell you that Jesus was born on April 13th my birthday. Hmm. 
But for the sake of religious assembly, religious whatever from Rome and the rest of that, December 25 was chosen whether to worship a pagan god or not. It has become a useful tool for us to use to reach souls as we do today. So let's assume by any stretch of the imagination that this day is an acceptable day to remember that our Savior was born. Throw away all the theological arguments that waste people's energy. And remember he was born. And what was he born for? Your freedom. See, Jesus will not have rest until you are free. Your freedom is his reward. Living free from sin. Free from oppression. Free from poverty. Is the mission of, this, of Jesus. For this purpose was he born. That you might be free. Your captivity causes him pain. Your bondage causes Jesus pain. He is still praying and interceding because your freedom is his major preoccupation. Until you are free, whosoever the son shall make free is what, sir? Is free. So your freedom is his preoccupation. It is the obsession of his heart. He wants to see you free. Free from drugs. He wants to see you free. Free from pornography. He wants to see you free. Free from addiction. How could you be saved from something and you're still bound by the same? He died for your sins. Why should the same thing he died for still have control over you? That's why your freedom is his concern. He paid the full price. He spared nothing. When he was born and when he was going to die, he spared nothing for your freedom to be guaranteed. The price is fully paid. You can walk away from anything that has kept you in captivity. My pastor taught me in 1989 when I asked my pastor, I said, Sir, I'm a young man. And, I, I, and before I gave my life to Christ, I lived a wild life. And I said, sir, how am I going to live a life free of girls? How am I going to live a life free of drugs? All these kind of things. And you know what he said to me? He said, read Romans chapter 6. And I, that was what changed my life, sir, 34 years ago. Romans chapter 6. And it says, sin shall not have dominion over you. Sin shall not have dominion. And he says, son, sin has been commanded not to have dominion over you. He said, but there is a problem. He said, you become a slave to sin when you yield to sin. So, who makes sin to have power over us? We give sin the right to rule. Somebody say, I withdraw it. You are not talking like somebody that wants to leave it. Somebody quickly say, I withdraw, I withdraw. So, 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 um, uh, 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 drinking does not somebody say pastor did he have so much power over me no if it has power who gave it the bottle did not jump on your head you yielded to the bottle you can withdraw it haven't you heard that they withdraw license medical council withdraw medical doctor's license pharmaceutical councils withdraw license am I correct even in the legal practice, they can withdraw your license. So why can't you withdraw the license you gave sin to rule over you? Tell yourself, I withdraw it. And how are you going to do that? Not by your power. By Christ living in you and Christ ruling over you. Father, by your grace, I withdraw the right. That sin has over me. I'm not using might. I'm using grace. So number one. He was born for your freedom. Please write this down. Number two. Jesus Christ was born. Not only to bring you freedom. But he was born to bring you forgiveness. Forgiveness. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 32. The Bible says. God forgave you. Because of Christ. God forgives you because of Christ. And be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, if as God, for whose sake? For Christ's sake, did what? Forgive you. 
So I want to let you know that he was born to secure your forgiveness. Somebody say, I'm forgiven. Come on, talk to me loud and clear. Say, I'm forgiven. Say like you mean, say, I'm forgiven. Because he has secured forgiveness, you can ask for it. Father, forgive me. And it is available. Wait a minute. C can I help somebody here? God does not manufacture forgiveness on, ask basis, on asking basis. Uh -huh. You've asked, eh? Okay. Um, Holy Ghost, can we now let's manufacture forgiveness? No, no, no. See, forgiveness is an ocean. Is that okay? Available and waiting for you. Your thirst, the fact that you are thirsty doesn't mean there's no water. See, if there's no water in Abuja, it doesn't mean there's no water on the earth. Are you aware that there are communities that don't have water in Lagos, but we have the ocean close to Lagos? Huh? So it is not the absence of water that's making communities to be in thirst. It is a lack of connection to the water. When you are asking, you are sub, when you are saying, Father, forgive me, it means you are acknowledging the availability of forgiveness. You don't ask for what you hope God will create. You ask for what you know God has made available. <laughs> Do you ask somebody to forgive you who you think can't forgive you? Have you ever thought of going to meet a madman? A madman who doesn't have sense, oh God, please forgive me. You don't ask him because you know he has no sense of judgment enough to render such to you. His sense of judgment has been impaired. Am I correct? So you don't expect him to offer that to you. So you only ask for forgiveness from someone that you know is not a psychopath that has the capacity to offer you what you're asking for. So when we go to God and we say, Father, forgive me. We are not asking because we want him to look at us and see how miserable we are. And now say, okay, look, how do I create forgiveness? No, we are asking because he's a forgiving God and he has forgiveness in abundance. So Jesus was born to bring you forgiveness. No matter how bad it is, no matter what you've done here today, we just want to let you know that Jesus was born to bring you forgiveness. And you can receive that forgiveness here today. Number three, Jesus was born to bring you adoption. Jesus was born not just to forgive you and leave you there. We don't forgive you. We don't set you free. What you've done, don't do it again, no. Bye-bye, no. He sets us free, forgives us, and adopts us. He brings us into his own family. And you know what I love about the adoption that God has given to all of us? Everybody look up here. How many of you know about adoption? Taking somebody's child, making that child your own. Raise your hand if you understand adoption. Raise your hand if you know adoption. If you understand it. Wave it again. Wave it now like you really are. Say I am an adopted child. <laughs> all of us here, we are all what? So when families call me and say, Pastor Sam, we want to adopt children. I say, because you are a senior, you are the senior adopted one. We are all adopted. So you are like God when you adopt children. You are like God when you adopt other people's children. Because you were Satan's child. You are your father, the devil. When you decide to give your life to Jesus, you decamped from his family. And God decides to have you become a member of his family. The beautiful thing about the adoption into God's family is that God makes you equal with his son. Are you trying to clap or you, you don't understand what we're saying? Number two, God gives you the same inheritance with his son. You, mama, you call it what, mama? Joint heirs. That's what the Bible says, as he is, so am I. Let's leave this matter for now. So, he was born to bring you adoption. Not only was he born to bring you adoption, he was also born to bring you blessings. Blessings. The Bible says in Ephesians 1, 3, 
every spiritual blessing in heavenly places have been given to us who have been adopted into the family of God. Somebody say, I am blessed. That is what, that is what Jesus, the birth of Jesus does for us. It, it, it brings us blessings. And those blessings include healings, deliverance, freedom, sound mind. That's what Jesus is coming into this world did for us. That's what changed. That's what changed people, lives of people like us. One of the blessings that Jesus brings to our lives that you will not find written in the Bible, but it's part of the blessings. He said, it makes your English fine. Because that's one of the blessings that me I found. I'm telling you this, ma. I gave my life to Christ and barely a week after, I, as I'm preaching, my friends will be saying, I bet, oh boy, stop all this uh, American English way they speak. I bet, I bet stop all this. I bet, I bet speak correct English. Ah. So I, I didn't know what was going on. Sir, so I still can't explain till tomorrow. It was not a school I went to. It was nothing I studied. It was immediately after I gave my life to Christ. My friends were the first to notice that my English has changed. I did not know. I have seen women who could not read. But when they give their lives to Christ, I come from a deeper life background, you will see those miracles there. I have a friend, Dr. Friday, lectures in Abu Zaria. We were, we were classmates together. His mother began to read miraculously. When she gave her life to Jesus, she just carried the Bible and began to read. I'm telling you what Jesus inside you can do in your life. It has turned ordinary people to become extraordinary people. Have you heard about a man called Apostle Babalola? The founder of CAC. The man could not read. But there is a church that is spreading globally in his name today because of that man. The cherubim and seraphims. Most of these churches, cherubim and seraphim, um, select them and, and you know, all, most of them, their founders were not properly educated. Mommy, Daddy, Obadari. I mean, this, these people, they couldn't even speak English, but they commanded power. Talk about redeemed. The redeemed Christian church of God. The founder could not read or write. But see redeemed today. Oh, come on somebody, lay your hands on yourself. Say, I need Jesus inside. Come on somebody, say, Jesus, enter and alter my life. Ah. This Jesus is beautiful. It's not church. Jesus is real. Pastor Sam, I didn't go to school. Let Jesus come inside you. Pastor Sam, I don't know how to write. Let Jesus come inside you. Pastor Sam, I don't know how to speak. Let Jesus enter you. Pastor Sam, I come from a poor family background. Let Jesus enter you. I was in Kaduna. Kaduna, I think the university in Kaduna, I was speaking to them. And I noticed that they were showing pictures of, I didn't know where to get all of the God all of that from, but they were showing pictures of me, Apostle Selma, and the rest of that. And I said to them, I said, guys, did you know? Okay, you were there with me, sir. And I said to them, I said, guys, I said, I was born in this Kaduna. I was born in the barracks. And I said, but it's amazing to know, sir, that people like Pastor Matthew are shipping over from the barracks. See what Jesus has turned a barrack boy into. Do you know the English we speak in the barracks? Oh, God. When you hear us speak English in the barracks, the confidence with which we speak, you think we know what we're saying. The barracks is a place where you create English that don't exist. You will hear things like you are a, a bagger fool. <laughs> you are a non-concomitant. <laughs> Bombastic element. It's in the barracks. It's in the barracks you will hear that the plane you are seeing on the, in the sky is actually on a road. And we all believe it. How did God raise people from that place? How is a Zaria boy like Apostle Selman from the Barak area in Zaria? How is that person making influence globally? 
I'm talking to you about Jesus is not a church. Jesus is a person. Don't experience church. Experience Jesus. Let him come on the inside of you. Your IQ will jump up. I can tell you that. When Jesus comes on the inside of you, eternal life comes inside, your IQ will jump up. Your performance in school will move to another level. Young people, let Jesus come on the inside of you. Let him touch your brain. You know what David said? I have understanding more than the ancients. I have understanding more than the ancients. I have superior understanding than my own teachers. I saw it in my secondary school, sir. My own teacher, my own teachers will call me to their own class, to their own offices and ask me to be counseling them. As an SS3 student. It was so serious sir. About two, three of them were fighting to be my school mother. So I decided not to adopt any. So that all of them can be reaching out to me. <laughs> one of them, her husband was the senior person in charge of Stalin Winthrop in those days. And then the other one, her husband works with Guinness. Senior man, bless women. One lecture teaches biology, the other one teaches English. They all took me like their son. Sir, take Jesus out of me. They will slap me out of their presence. Jesus is the reason why your life makes sense. Are, are, you, are, you, are you excited and appreciating him here? Look at you. Look at you. If not for Jesus, you'll be waking up with bottles of alcohol. If not for Jesus, you would have lost your mind. If not for Jesus, you may have been dead and forgotten. If not for Jesus, your life will have been wasted. Is there a grateful person in this house today? If Jesus is the reason why your life is what it is. If Jesus is the reason why you are blessed with children. If Jesus is the reason why your career is rising. Your business is flourishing. If Jesus is the reason why you've not lost your mind. If Jesus is the reason why you have a hope for tomorrow. Will somebody shout Jesus? Jesus. Somebody shouted Jesus. Jesus. As you remain standing. Remember that Jesus was born to bring you to a higher place. Ah. Because of Jesus. Look at this. Tiffels, can I have you? Look at this carefully. He forgave you. He freed you. Is that okay? He blessed you. He adopted you. But know what he now did? He now said, come up. I don't want you to be on that level. That where I am, you may be also. That's why he said, even though you are yet to go to heaven, you're already seated in heavenly places. Am I talking to somebody here? You're not getting me. See, I know you don't understand what I'm talking about. And I'm going to show you why you, you don't understand it. You are, where are you seated? Come on, get, get a chair. Get a chair. Get a chair quickly. Sit down there. Uh, get a chair. Bring it up. Bring it up. Sit, sit down. Where are you seated? See, he can't talk now. Where are you seated? In Kuali? I said, where are you seated? In Guarimpa? I said, where are you seated? Okay. In heavenly places. Let's begin to describe where that place is. Say it again. Far. And then above. Wait, 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 wait. Can I have three people, three, three of us here? Three people, just three of us. Quickly come, three of us, just three of us. Far above what? Principalities and powers. Huh? Can they put that scripture out there? Now, so you are far. This one is even not far. You are far and you are above. Somebody say, I did far and I did above. 
Say it again. Say, I, I am far and above. <laughs> say, I am far and above. If you are far and above, the presupposition in this issue then implies that you are beyond. Is that okay? So that means you are beyond the reach of what you are above. Because you are not just above them, you are far above them. So you are beyond them. Is that okay? Far above what? How many? Oh, come on, talk to me. How many are you above? Mami, what a spirit? E Mary. Ifa. Shango. Voodoo. Juju. Magic. Enchantment. Divination. Sorcery. Witchcraft. Extrasensory perception, telepathy, mediums, seances, projections, talisman. You are far and above. How many of them? Prince, what? Number two? Number three? Number four? Number five, in case all the ones we mentioned didn't capture them. Maybe these ones are in your local dialect. Maybe they have a name in Akwaibom. Uh, what do you call them in Akwaibom? Huh? What's it? What, what are those things people fight with in Akwaibom? If before, he fought. Uh -huh. Yeah. Olumba, Olumba, Ubu. And every name, your freedom has come. Your amen is sounding like somebody that doesn't understand. I said your freedom has come. And every name that is what? If anything has a name and it is not of God, you are far and you are. I didn't hear you now. You are. And you are. You are. And you are. Say it loud. You are. And you are. Every name. The next time somebody in your office look at you and say, if you don't take time, I will show you in this office. Call the person and say, bros, come here. Do you love your children? Madam, try other people. Don't try me. Me and you are not on the same. Yes, sir. We are not on the same level. Am I talking to somebody here? Me and you will not be mates. If you then look for trouble, no look for mine. Because you are announcing your burial by attempting me. <laughs> I like it. Hmm? Chima, somebody look at you in the office or somebody in the family look at you and say, sir, I will finish you. Finish uh, <laughs> Touch my head. Finish you. Best the way you know if you reach, now you go finish. You know why you are afraid? You know why you've been afraid? You know why you've not been able to sleep? Because you don't know where you belong. In fact, it is so bad that the way you see yourself it's that you are under them, under that's why that's is so the way you see yourself is as if they can crush you, they can't crush you because they can't reach you. We are not bragging, we know what we are talking about. I want you to come out of this Christmas service a different person. I want you to enter 2024 with a new resolve. No weapon formed against me shall ever prosper. Enna to fala gadazia, whosoever sits on a chair to say you will damage me, you will lose your chair, you will lose your office. Whosoever attempts you will go down for your sake. Put the scripture back on the screen. Far above what? So Jesus was born to bring you higher. 
sorry sir but pastor say were you there when we did the crusade by Manabasi's block where they said there was one witch going around you were there that day sir we were having a crusade in Ikeja cantonment and then I was in my prayer room already people have gathered the place was packed this was about 94 95 there about the place was packed and then some I don't know who it was that came to tell me my place of prayer and they said there's trouble I said what is the trouble he said Saha he said the head of all the witches in the Keja cantonment they said the man just showed up and that the man is moving around quietly and that is blowing something into the atmosphere I said eh. <laughs> the lion is the king of the jungle sir he turneth not away for any there are some of us sir when you if you want to see the best of us let trouble come now those kind of trouble now they make us happy as soon as i had it i said i'm leaving the place of prayer and i came down i said where is the man i said immediately i said tell everybody connected to us begin to pray in tongues Ma, literally the man disappeared from the place he should have waited you round up his destiny on that ground I was 15 years old 15, 16 I will go to Gomez girls secondary school for crusade and as we get there I was watching my mentor my mentor pastor Andy Obida he would just stand hi I saw power. Now I was exposed to power very early, sir. Pastor Andy Obida would just stand. I would say, the Bible says, and the Lord was angry and smoke began to come out of his nostrils. He said, right now, he said, let the smoke of God from his nostrils begin to fill this house. And he said, let every stranger that has been hiding in every secret place, let them begin to fade out of their hiding places. <laughs> sir, I'll be watching like this. Come and see demons checking out. The revelation he has behind that, I know the scripture. I know that scripture. I've been trying to break into the revelation that commands that authority. This is 34 years. I've not been able to break into it. So he doesn't pray. He will just say, right now, Lord, let the smoke that comes out from your nostrils fill this room. Come and see manifestation. That is when you will know the seniority we have in Christ. That is when you will, you will love this Jesus. Guy, you will be proud you belong to a winning team. You see demons checking out. So in order to keep people like us in, at our level engaged, he will now send us to people with smaller, smaller demons. Come and see us. Oh yeah, come out. Yeah, yeah, okay. But we are happy. Because the little way we do, they try, they walk. Come out. Yeah. Out. Out. Hey, hey, this is the walk. Oh. Did they walk? Come and touch someone. Say, we've got power. You are talking like somebody that has water. Say, we've got power. That's what Jesus was born to do. He was born to bring power into your life. He was born to give you power. He said, tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with what? power and that power is over principalities you know who principalities are the powers of darkness that rule over nations come on people look at me here have you remember the case of daniel how the daniel said god the lord said to daniel the angel said to daniel we're bringing you answer what belongs to you we're bringing it but the prince over the nation blocked the angel from bringing what belongs to you somebody's watching me what belongs to you is being kept by the prince over this nation but today we pull down that prince so there's something my wife and i do every time we travel to into every any country the moment we start Entry into the approach. Approach is usually 15 minutes into the airport. The moment we enter into the approach, we begin to take authority over the nations. I will say, look, we speak to you, O nation. You will not hinder what God has sent me to do here. I subject the power over this nation. I subject you 
under the lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. My ministry will not be hindered in this land. That is why you see every nation we go to, you see the power of God breaking out in every nation. Pastors in that place who say, we've not seen the power of God like this. I say, well, because the powers here have stopped you. And not because they have the power to stop you, but because of the limitation of your vision and your understanding of scripture. I function with a superior mentality. I came into Guarimpa here when we started the first church we had, when we had the collapse issue. One day I was praying, I said, Lord, what happened? And the Lord said to me, how can you enter a place and not dispossess the power over a new land, a new, nobody was here, nothing was here, we're the first to enter here. And you think because the land is free, the place is free? Some of you that are the first to enter a locality to build your house, you wonder why you're going through battles, you did not dispossess the place of the power over the place. I get back, you know. He was born to bring transformation to your life. Thank you, guys. He was born to change you. He was born to make your life better. If any man be in Christ, is new. Hallelujah. If any man be in Christ, is what? He's a new. Somebody say new. That's the key word. Once Jesus is born in your heart, he makes you what? New husband. New what? <laughs> so husbands that used to beat, they can't do what anymore. Ah, but that's, that is the first way your wife will know that this Jesus has really entered you. Madam. 1,000 words per minute. You can cut a man to pieces with your words. And there are some of you women, your own is not words. You could just look at the man. Just the way you look at him, you've you scattered him. When you are born again, all things become water. Madam, you don't look like that anymore. You don't talk like that anymore. When you are born again, what you used to drink, mm-mm. Where you used to sleep on Saturday night before coming to church on Sunday. Mm -mm. What you watch when nobody is there in the name of I'm working on the system. Mm -mm. When Christ is in us, our lives are changed. Everything about our lives change. For those of you already born again, I celebrate the fact that Christ is in you. I hope you get to appreciate what you have in Christ. Remain standing.